Here it is. Welcome everybody. Special greeting to Kenya from Texas. We are on day number four. Time goes by fast. Looking at marriage, relationships. I call it for two to be one. Keeping your vows while keeping your vows. Bible-based, Christ-centered relationships. I will pray in a minute. Um, then we have a few announcements. And um, then I will read a couple quotes and we look at application, what we can actually do as couples. This series actually here in Kenya has helped me think through my program. I need to split my papers apart a little more. Too much information on one page. Uh, I'm going to develop an introduction page and then uh, one page on creation, one page on the fall and the consequences. David and Bathsheba might be enough for its own page. And I have a whole series, but it's also nice to have everything on one or two pages and not 20. So I'm, I'm thinking what is the best approach, not for me, but for couples uh, to, to have something in their hands. Important topics today. Um, somebody thought, I think it was George Barna. He's a researcher, especially in, in church matters. I don't have the original study, but I think it was him who found that if couples do four things, the divorce rate drops to 1%. So we will look at 10 things couples can do, but uh, those four things will be part of it. Best way to start with anything in life, not end, but start, is with prayer. We will pray together. I will pray with you and for you. So let us pray together. Almighty God, we need to thank you for inventing human beings. And not just that, but the idea of male and female and divinely inspired human love between a man and a woman. What a wonder. And now, how much a heartache too. How many problems, abuse, disappointment. We seek your help, God. We seek help from heaven, from above. We pray for a full conversion of our own hearts for justification and sanctification and one day glorification. We repent. We don't just want to try to be better, make an effort, where we actually repent and want to turn around and live life differently, especially when it comes to our marriages. Grant us purity, uh, appropriate touch, appropriate relationships, appropriate looks, and teach us at your feet, we pray. But before we say amen, we want to pray specifically for couples that might watch this, or maybe just a husband or a wife, that you might solve and rescue and save an impossible situation. We ask that you might prevent a divorce among some couples, that you stop, that you prompt people living inappropriately that you stop 
that. Introduce your word to our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I think Brother Zadok had an announcement. I'll make it after we're done, Pastor. Okay, later on. All right. We'll get started right away. I would like to read two quotes that I copied and pasted this morning. It came to my mind that Ellen White had commented on the rib coming out of Adam's side. Very important quote, page 46 of Patriarchs and Prophets. I will just read it. God himself gave Adam a companion. Interesting, this emphasis on it was God who brought them together. He provided a help meet for him, a helper corresponding to him, one who was fitted to be his companion, who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam. Now, here, here it comes signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. A part of man, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. And and then... Uh, Ellen White quotes from Ephesians 5.29, which we looked at yesterday. A Christ-like man is what a woman submits to or to whom a woman submits. Not just a man, Christ-like man. For no man ever has hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Ephesians 5.29. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one. Interesting that the man needs to leave, not the woman. And one short paragraph um, later, I, I can't skip this one. God celebrated the first marriage. Again, this emphasis, the coming together is facilitated, catalyzed by God himself. Thus, the institution has for its originator, the creator of the universe. If he brought you together, he can keep you together. Marriage is honorable. It was one of the first gifts of God to man, and it is one of the two institutions that after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise, the other one Sabbath. When the divine principles are recognized, and obeyed in this relation. Marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race. It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. Which means, um, I would venture to say, if your marriage is in trouble, and I think at some point all our marriages have problems, why? Because I'm in it. I'm, I'm in my marriage. I have problems. And marriage will make problems bigger. But marriage can also solve problems. If there are problems, it means most likely that I am violating a divine principle. I'm not acknowledging a divine principle or I'm not obeying a divine principle. And we humans have a huge capacity to, to deceive ourselves, to fool ourselves, and to blame others. So I need to incorporate those two quotes in, in my papers. And I can't make the print any smaller and squish more and more information in there. So the solution is to multiply the papers. I want to uh, take you to the application. What can we do? 
not just what do we think, how do we think about Genesis, the, the separation, and then Adam and Eve coming together, the, the stop signs of David and Bathsheba. He could have stopped the, the incredible call by Paul in Ephesians that the submission takes place to a converted husband who acts like Jesus Christ to the point of death. I will bring up another paper here. Green. I'll fade it in and out every now and then, but I want to show you the top 10. Um, yesterday, we read these questions. We, we, we've already read those. I'm going to go straight to what I would call my top 10 things to do as a couple, the essentials of life. And th this applies to married couples and divorced couples and not married couples, um, singles, um, not married couples, <laughs> pre-marital couples, um, this applies to life, I think, those 10 items. Now, as I said, I think it was George Barner who said there are four things, those, those four things that reduce the divorce rate from 50% to 1%. He looked at couples that were still together after 20, 30, 40 years. What were those couples doing? I, I need to hunt down the original study. He said, number one, they pray together. They read the Bible together. They go to the church together and they sit together and they spend time together. I think it was Samuel Bakioki. He has passed away now who, who once told us that uh, he and his wife did not love each other when they got married. Yep. Couples like that. Most couples are in love and they get married. He said they would kneel by the bedside and ask God for love. And God gave it to them. Read the Bible together. Do you have a time every day where you as a couple read the Bible together? Do you go to church together? Do you have a form of fellowship? And do you spend time together? There's a, a statistic that says that couples, some couples break up within the first year of marriage. I've seen that myself. What happens? They spend a lot of time together when they're dating and courting and they talk and they're polite, especially the man is polite, shows his best side. They get married and then they have to work and they don't see each other as much. They're tired and they have to get the oil change done, work on taxes, and they become two singles in one home. Um, but those four items, I expanded them to 10. Here they are. Before you get a divorce, would you try the following? Without necessarily directly solving your marriage problems, would you commit to... I don't know how long, but to doing the following 10 things and, and see what it does to you yourself and to your relationship. Number one, prayer. That seems obvious, but I find it interesting that the disciples came to Jesus asking, teach us to pray. I am sure they have prayed before. They were taught in a Jewish culture they prayed, but then they realized they didn't pray. And uh, I, I could talk for hours about prayer. I, I love the topic and activity of prayer. But my ministry, my marriage, and myself changed fundamentally. 180 degree turnaround in my life when I started to pray. Uh, I, I got church properties through prayer at half price. My church attendance doubled without evangelism, just through prayer. Um, 
story after story. It's not a candy machine, but without prayer, for, just forget it. Okay, it's that serious. We have to learn to pray and we have to do it. We, we have so many seminars and DVDs and booklets and pamphlets and devotionals. You, you need to change your life where you have solid time and you press with humility and the blood of Jesus, you press into the throne room of God the Father, the heavenly sanctuary, the most holy. And this is where you press, I, I like the word press your petitions. And that will change your life like nothing else. Prayer. Bible study. Dude, life gets busy. We rush out of the house, but do you have Bible study in your life, in your personal life, in your secret life? It's the secret service. And uh, this morning I discovered something. It, it, it was amazing. Just two words uh, in my personal Bible study. And I have to cut YouTube. I don't have Netflix. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. I use Facebook for communication, but I have to shut off electronics, no screens. I have a paper Bible. If I lost the Bible, I would miss it. I have prayer time without being in a rush. And those two elements, you notice I'm not solving your marriage problems. I'm not working on your communication. I'm, I'm targeting your heart. Expose your heart to God. Do it. Try it very consistently, okay? seven days a week. Sabbath included. Sabbath is the best time. Uh, Friday evening, the phase from, from not Sabbath to Sabbath is, is holy time. And then this, these lingering sunset hours, I think Sabbath is more than 24 hours. Uh, the edges of the Sabbath we guard. And then the sun setting Oh, it's such a special time with God and, and for God. I can only encourage you, if you are not doing it, here is your starting key to a changed life. Develop a prayer life and a study life, you with God, personally, alone with the Almighty. Love. Let me tell you something about love. <laughs> I, I love my puppies. I, I love healthy food. I love nature. I, I love my wife. I love my children. I love God. All with one word, love. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul interrupts himself. He talks about not love, spiritual gifts. And 1 Corinthians 12, then comes speaking in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14. And he stops himself between 12 and 14 and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are missing the most important gift. Love is not an emotion produced by humans. Love is a gift from God passed on to other people. Love. We, let me put it this way. We, we are not buckets that God fills. We are pipelines. And the more appropriate, genuine, godly love you pass on, the more you receive. So uh, I think it's Romans chapter five, verse five. I would have to look that up. God, God puts his love in our hearts. That is good news. If you don't love your wife, I've had a couple tell me, the wife told me, I knew during the wedding that this would not work out. I've stopped weddings two weeks before the wedding. But I've had people tell me, I don't love my husband. I don't love my wife. That is not the end of the marriage. Why not? Because we, we don't have to produce love of our own wicked hearts, uh, deceitful above all things. We receive love as a gift. And so instead of trying to love somebody you don't love, ask God for love. 
time. Uh, time is absolutely crucial. Um, I suggest to couples, as a rule of thumb, an hour a day, an evening a week, a day per month, and a week per year. Do you get that hour a day, evening a week, a day per month, and a week per year where you go away if, if feasible, but you set time aside as a couple, not to solve your marriage problems, but just to spend time together. But you have to make a commitment to not be negative or criticize. You have to start this time together saying, I will be a Christian during my intentional time with my wife. And I'm not talking about the physical aspect of marriage, but speaking, talking, listening, listening with two ears without saying anything, listening to what your partner is actually saying, undivided attention without the cell phone. Yeah, no glancing at the cell phone. Time together. That solves a lot of problems without solving problems. Um, let me talk to you about this, this time together and, and it, it goes together with communication. Listening, I've made it a practice as a pastor to, uh, I'm going to look at you while I talk about this, so important. I'll pull it back up here in a minute. Uh, let's face to face. I was a hospice chaplain for several years and a pastor for almost 30 years before then, a college professor, and I've, I've developed something in my people relationships and visitation. This is free of charge, applies to ministry. But let me tell you a secret real quick. As a pastor, as a church member, as a husband, as a wife, this works. Number one, approach a person to love them unconditionally. L love the, the person that doesn't deserve to be loved. Number two, listen. Don't talk. Listen to them speak. And when you think you're done listening, listen some more. It takes an enormous amount of patience. We, we want to speak and we want to say what's on our mind. Try it. It will change the relationships to your fellow human beings fundamentally. Listen and then listen some more. Why? You want to learn about the person. Learn something that you didn't know before. My goal when I do funerals is to never do a funeral. Uh, are you listening? I want to do that person's funeral, not a funeral. I don't pull out old funerals and then tweak them a little and make a generic funeral. What I want to do is I want to speak about that person and tie it in with the Bible and it's that person's funeral. Same with weddings. Okay. I, I have some standard weddings, but I want to tweak them and create them for that particular couple. I've, I've done weddings where I spoke for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and I've never used that sermon again ever. It, it was only for that person. You, your goal is to love, listen, learn, and then you lead. Then you take one step with that person, not against that person. Okay? You want to walk with that person. Jesus did that with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were crushed. They were leaving Jerusalem. They were leaving the church, practically. And he joined them and walked with them, and he listened to them. Why are you so sad? They explained. He said, what things? Tell me more. Listen to them. And then he pretended to keep walking and they had to invite him. See, he's leading them to invite him into their home. And then they returned joyful to Jerusalem and things were changed 180 degrees. Do not give up if your marriage is a mess. It can be turned around. And then number five, leave. What do I mean by that? Leave something 
positive behind in your interaction with your fellow human being. You love, you listen, you learn, you lead by walking with them. And then you leave, uh, uh, let me use a pastoral ministry, I visit a church member, I leave a business card, I leave a church bulletin, I leave a stuffed animal. I, I spend money on stuffed animal. It, it works in America. I, I leave something behind with a family, with a child, with a couple that they have after I'm gone. So with couples, you can't always do stuffed animals or spend money. But when your time together is over, does that person, your wife, have a positive feeling about you spending time with her? Or did you make it worse with your impatience and anger and rolling your eyes and looking at your cell phone and, and not listening? So how, how does the interaction change? I'm doing a study with a teenager in Germany right now going through the Gospels and we're looking at how does the situation start Jesus comes into the picture, and how does the person end up? What do they choose? What do they say? What's the end of that particular situation? I hope that makes some sense. So it's a very intentional way of spending time and communicating. Now, that's easy for me to say. Suit and tie, camera rolling, people watching. Oh, Pastor Ingo is so great. I have to choose to act like that and practice what I preach. And sure enough, I, I knew that would already happen. I'm doing a marriage seminar here in Kenya, for Kenya. And uh, I knew God would test me. And I also knew Satan would challenge me on that. And so yesterday I had planned to spend another hour in preparation for this. And my wife needed something done. And it was not mean-spirited. She did not try to pull me away from my Kenya preparation. It, it needed to be done. And sometimes I, it's okay to say, can we do that later? Honey, sweetie, whatever you call your wife. Um, I'm really busy right now. That is perfectly okay. But I evaluated the situation. I was ready for Kenya yesterday. And uh, I thought, she needs me right now. Let me spend time helping my wife doing this and this and this. And my attitude could have been, doesn't she realize I'm busy? I'm doing a, a whole week with Kenya and I have Denmark and Norway waiting for me. And, and the Germans are waiting for another study on, on 1 John chapter 5 or 7 and 8 we're studying and and I have a meeting tonight here in Texas with a group about a topic and I'm busy. So I have a lower nature reaction, a sinful reaction sometimes in my mind. I have to decide what do I do with that? Do I allow that to come into my heart and hurt my relationship in my marriage? Or do I pause for a second and decide I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 husband? Tomorrow, I'm still thinking about it, how transparent I want to be. Tomorrow, I might, I haven't decided yet, I might tell you about my worst possible moment in my life. And that has to do with marriage. And I had to make a decision. It was a difficult one. And it's not that long ago. It was August 2018. I might talk about it. I might not um, have to decide. How much personal life do I share? Then we have another element here. Um, I should bring it back up so you can see it. And that leads me to think I need to make the font bigger, have less text. And I hope it works. Less information gets processed better than too much information. Character, money, time, love, Bible, prayer. Let's talk about money for a second. I'm not an expert in money. I have made money mistakes that have hurt my family. Um, 
I've been on food stamps, believe it or not, not, not when I was a pastor, but uh, in Germany. Uh, pinching poverty in the Western world, we can't claim that term really, but uh, we do have poverty as well. Money is such a marriage killer, the wrong use of money. Since I'm not an expert, I will tell you three things that you need to do with money and that I'm dealing with with money and I'm wrestling with it. And uh, it's just three things, very simple. Number one, uh, they, they come later on, but I'll, I'll tell you up front and then I'll repeat it. Take care of your past, get out of debt. Number two, figure out your present situation. Budget, do not spend more than you make. And number three, plan for the future without hoarding. I need a number four, give money away. Uh, if you make a little extra and you don't need all your money, uh, you need to help people. And it's a joy to help people. So really four things. Character, character is a Greek term. They have found, I think it's in Thessalonica, Greece, that the process of putting a value on a coin is called to characterize the coin. Your character is a value imprint and you have to work on your character. And the only way you can do that is die to self. It's a death. It's a painful process. And you, you resurrect as a new person, but don't work on your wife's character. Well, we read Ephesians 5. You, you introduce the word as a husband to your wife. But you work on your character. Okay? Your character needs work. Purity. Um, if you have a bad habit, if you cannot control the use of electronics, if you're watching the wrong things on the internet, the solution by Jesus is not to try harder. It needs a decisive, radical change. I had a church member who got rid of his computer. They couldn't control it. Couldn't manage staying away from bad websites. Jesus says, don't tweak your life. Don't try radical, aggressive, decisive change in your life. Stop it. Okay? Don't do less. Don't stop it. 100%. No more of those websites. Character development. Cut off your hand, your eye, not literally, but if we did, if, we, if I started digging in my eye, start cutting my hand, I would probably decide I need to quit this sin instead of losing my hand. So highly valuable. And Jesus says, pretend you're cutting off your hand, plug out your eye. That is how serious this is. Stop it. Communication, already talked about that, no pun intended. But we have two ears, we have one mouth. The key, I think, to communication, I'm no psychologist, I'm not a communications expert, but I do know one thing, listening works miracles. How do I know that? Because the highest confession of Judaism is Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one powerful statement. I love it. Out of that one statement, that God is one, comes the highest commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. That needs to be told your children, cross-generational ministry. That needs to be put on your hand and your forehead, which leads us to the mark of the beast. Okay? And God says, listen, Israel, and in both Hebrew and Greek, the word for obeying is the word for listening. So my, my simple advice is from experience, observation, and scripture is if you have problems in your marriage, try, try one thing. Listen. Ask your wife, how do you feel about our relationship? And then listen for one hour. Don't defend yourself. Don't make excuses. Listen to her. 
the, the other side of this coin is speak kindly, positively in an uplifting manner. Slow down. Don't speak angrily, hastily. Don't roll your eyes. Don't stomp around. Control yourself. Okay, put yourself under the control of God. Um, we have a baby horse right now we're raising so that we can sell it for money, a source of income. And in Greek, the word meek is not weak. Meek is not weak. Meek means that a wild horse is now under the control of a master. That is meekness. And you men, we men need to be under the control of God when we relate to our wives. Communication. Community, well, yeah, we, we were meant to live in community. I think the word Ubuntu, that's a Linux, it's a computer, uh, what do you call it? Software operating system. Ubuntu means together, community. There, there are times I have a colleague, he says that in almost every wedding that I attend that where he performs the wedding, he says there are times, the, a marriage is like a door and there are times where the door needs to be shut. But there's a time where the door is open and you as a married couple, you are a community person. Are you doing something as a couple for the community? Are you a giver or a taker? My first board meeting, a treasurer told me, Ingo, you just witnessed the takers. They're givers and takers in life. Are you givers as a couple? But if you only give, you run empty and need to recharge your battery. Um, figure out as a couple that you're not just a couple, but you're part of a community. Health, are you healthy? Are you staying healthy? Are you actively doing something for your health? And uh, the men, the women usually take this more serious. The women are more likely to eat vegetables and salad. And uh, you men need to be healthy, clean. Don't make excuses. Don't drink alcohol. Don't smoke. Don't do things in secret that are bad for you. Hiding doesn't work. That will grow and one day explode. Okay, stop that. Stop that. Start living a healthy life. Are you living a life of service where you do something good to others? Those are my, I can talk for hours about every one of these, but th those are my 10 points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And then I have a red question mark here. You see that? And then I will quickly go through the rest. And we still have tomorrow. Plenty of time. Is there something, an area in your life that I did not mention that needs to be addressed? You address that with God. I want to talk about that tomorrow. You can take your issues, your problems directly to God. And I don't know what it is. It could be your in-laws. It could be the car situation, work. It might be your childhood abuse in your childhood. Uh, what, what box number 11 is in your life that should be addressed? Take it to God first. Prayer and fasting. Let me highlight a few items about prayer here. Psalms 50 verse 15. One pastor gave me this uh, text. Thank you, Brian. Um, glad you were here. Maybe tomorrow again. God bless you. Yeah, I checked the chat while I'm talking because it affects what I'm saying as I'm going along. It's not an interruption. I'm happy for you to communicate with me. A pastor told me Psalm 50 verse 15 is God's phone number. Call upon me. In the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Mark chapter 135. And I've been inconsistent the last 30 years about this. When I was consistent about this, I saw miracles. Miracles. 
I remember I had a church problem in a church. I would get up at four o'clock in the morning with my German shepherd dog. Don't have him anymore. He got killed, uh, run over by a car. But the dog was happy. It's, it's about 4, 4.30 in the morning. And I get sleepy inside. So I went to the lake. So I wouldn't sleep through my prayer time. And the dog is happy. The stars are still out. The city is still asleep. And I'm wrestling with God. And I got such direct answers. It, it was astounding. And then I neglect this time. And I wonder why is my Christian life just so normal and mediocre? mediocre um so so flat and uh just the last few months i i've made a hard commitment to have this time with god especially in the mornings now in the morning having risen a long while before daylight do you see that a long while he went out and departed to a solitary place and there he prayed is that simple and we don't do it um now, the challenge is when you get up really early in the morning, you get sleepy. I'm not 20 anymore. So I, I have to rearrange my schedule and I have to cut out nonsense and time wasters. And I have to cut out even good things, not, not sin, that too, but I have to cut out good things so I have time for the best. Here's Gospel Workers 259. Love that quote. Gospel Workers 259. The greatest victories gained for the cause of God are not the result of labored argument, ample facilities, wide influence, or an abundance of means. And uh, I, I have to be honest. I like to be right, argue theologically. I like to know Greek and Hebrew better. And I wished I was fluent in Swahili and Norwegian and then come and preach in your language, and everybody applaud, and wow, Ingo speaks our It's pride, okay? I'm honest with you. I get positive feedback from that, but it's pride. Wide influence or abundance of means, yeah, I'd like to have more money, and then I could buy an Atom Mini uh, program switcher where with a push of a button, I could switch between my face that you don't really need to see. And my PowerPoint much easier and have a second camera. And, and Ellen White says, you don't need any of that. They are gained. The victories are gained in the audience chamber with God when with earnest, agonizing faith, men lay hold upon the mighty arm of power. And I can testify in public here. When I practice this and put aside my selfish ingo, I want, I want, I want. And I wrestle with God in secret, in the audience chamber of God. Then I see victory. Why don't we pray more? I planted a church with my wife in 2014. And I told the church, let's settle the music issue. I do not want endless music discussions at the board meeting. Let's, not, let, let's solve what kind of music we have and especially what kind of music we will not have. I put my son in charge, my oldest son, and we said only this type of music and no other music and any wedding, funeral, special music has to be filtered and approved. And we never had a music problem. Hey, um, so that, that worked really well. And I told my church, here's my point, no evangelism, no pathfinders. We are going to learn to pray. And for prayer meeting, we had as many people at the church in America as on Sabbath morning. It was wonderful. The children prayed. The, the older people prayed. We did not have a kids ministry separate the kids from. No, all together. All together we came and we prayed together. Wonderful experience. Matthew 17, 21 is not in all Bibles. This is Textus Receptus based. If you don't know what that means, no, no worries. There are different manuscripts in Greek and some Bibles don't have verse 21. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. I won't address fasting today or tomorrow, but it's a neglected practice in our personal lives. 
and in the life of the church. And I introduced fasting at Michigan Camp Meeting 2016. And I introduced fasting to my church. We intentionally fasted. And it's mostly no food. Okay, that's what fasting means. But it can be no electronics for a while. Um, just fast from something that is occupying your life. But fasting mainly means you go without food. Only do it if medically appropriate. And I bet Brother Zadok knows about fasting. Um, that would make a good program in Norway, by the way, fasting, now that I think of it. But I, all I'm saying is um, learn about fasting. Plenty of texts in the Bible. Ellen White speaks about it. And try that for your marriage, for your relationships. Introduce fast. Start with one meal. You skip one meal. And uh, I, I'm in a different culture. We eat way too much, way too much sugar way too much fat and foods we shouldn't eat. You might be in a different environment. Um, one time in the Philippines, I told a group of people that you need to exercise. Well, they work 12 hours a day in the rice fields. So I had to change my health talks. But you, you understand, discover prayer and fasting for your life. Please try it. Bible study. I have some texts here that I'm suggesting you read together. Uh, I won't go through them. Uh, there's one Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11. Um, young men, if you're not married yet, read it, memorize it. Okay? And I think the King James in English gets it right. Would be interesting what Kiswahili says. Um in the Hebrew, it actually says, how can a young man cleanse his way? That means he's already defiled as a young man. The NIV says, how can a young man keep his way pure? I'm not a Hebrew expert, but for what I'm seeing in the text, it's you've already taken a step too far. And it's by, how do you get back to purity? By keeping his word in your heart start memorizing scripture but not just memorizing an atheist can do that but from your head memorize with your heart as well yeah. read song of songs together the gospels acts study couples in the bible um money uh i i've been told by lawyers that the number one cause what they write down for cause of divorce is irreconcilable differences. Yeah, that comes from not listening, not talking honestly, not praying together. That the root cause of that. And by the way, a man is a man, a woman is a woman, which means we automatically, by nature, God designed that we have irreconcilable differences. I don't want to become a woman. I'm different from my wife. Amen. Praise God. So that's number one cause. Number two is money. And that's why I'm saying I need to work on my past debt reduction. Debt is it's like a chain around your neck. I need to figure out the present and... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not speaking from a book. I'm not speaking off the internet. I'm speaking from life. I'm a self-supporting pastor now. I have to think about my present. What is coming in? How is it coming in? Um, what am I spending? We have inflation here in Texas too. Unbelievable. We are witnessing, I think, the destruction of the middle class. That will, that will ignite war, revolution, civil war, um, yeah, we, I'm not a doomsday sayer, but I, I can see the possibility of total societal cultural disaster coming. The world has changed. And I also need to figure out, so what is smart stewardship? How do I give? How do I plan for the future? I need another car in five years, most likely. I don't want, if time lasts, I don't want that to be a crisis. So I need to plan ahead. 
but I also don't want to save, save, save for myself and ignore the cry of poverty around me and the people who need my help. So it, it requires wisdom. And we have a book called Councils on Stewardship. Highly recommended. Good book to read as a couple. Okay? I have a dollar. I don't even know what money you have in Kenya and Norway. It's kroner. But, but you receive some money for work. Well, what do you do with that money? It's God's money. Okay, What happens with that money? That takes thoughtful thinking. My dad sat me down when I was 13, 14, gave me some money, not a lot, had me write down how much I received. And then he had me write down everything I spent, new jeans, new clothes, uh, school books. And then every month, we compared my income with how much I spend. Thank you, dad, for doing that. That was very helpful. And I also need to figure out um, how do I help people? Who do I help? With how much? How often? That's very important. I, I can't just keep it to myself. Okay? I need to be a giver, not just a receiver. So that's my thinking on money. It's 8 p.m. I will introduce, and I'm going to read you hard questions because I, I still have quite a bit planned for tomorrow. Men, Adam, where are you? Serious question. And ladies, are you feminine? Uh, are you a woman? I'm not trying to be political or funny at all. This is serious business, are you working your, on yourself as being a man? And be careful defining yourself by culture. You know, here in Texas, America, men, the, the stereotype is the tough cowboy type with a gun. I don't have one. Um, I don't know if I turned on screen sharing. Oh, yeah, let me go back to the screen. Here, well, here's what I'm talking about. I find it helpful in marriage when men develop their manhood and when women develop their femininity and womanhood. Those are creation identities. Uh, of course, challenged by culture right now, but uh, I encourage you to ponder the following questions as a man and as a woman. I think we can take five more minutes or so. Are you a responsible person? If my water line is dripping, I should be the one to take care of that problem, not my wife. There are things that I need to do as a man for my family. And it's not being rough. It's not being tough. It's not watching soccer and, and sports that makes me a man. It is being a responsible person and taking care of business. Do you get done what needs to be done? There's a sound in my car. It needs an oil change. I think personally in my family, that's my responsibility. So I need to take, uh, I'm not a mechanic. I have two left hands. I, but I need to learn a few things about tools and fixing things. But on Monday, I'm taking my wife's car to an expert to see what's going on. And, and I'm not waiting two months or six months. And then uh, my wife's saying to my friends, I've asked him several times and we still have the car problems. And no, if, if I know I need to schedule it and get it done, not in June, but in April, okay, it's April right now. Are you staying on top of things? Or is, 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 the, is your place where you live a mess and you're not picking up and taking out trash and all that? Is your house in order? Are you sloppy? Do you keep promises? Do you act mature? Are you serious? What excuses do you make? Are you serious? Uh, I'm challenging myself on that. Uh, I'm, I have a funny bone, but I'm learning to filter it, especially when I speak and in the pulpit and in church. And I need to be a serious, not a grumpy, but a serious person. Life is very serious. What excuses do you make? Are you financially responsible? Do you make good choices? 
if you're making a big choice without your wife, chances are you are maybe making a bad choice. Do you help people? Do you treat women well? Learn men, if you're not married especially. I'm married men too, but boys, age 12, are you watching this? Learn how to treat women nicely and with respect. It will save your life. Your life will be much easier. Are you careful with men? Do you talk appropriately? Let me say a sentence that's not on my paper. I need to put it in here. A conference president warned us one time saying, pastors, be careful. Make sure that the shine in the woman's eye is not a reflection of the shine in your eyes. Did you understand what I said? Do not be flirtatious. Don't, don't flirt with other women or women with other men. Okay? That there is a, there's a clear line between flirtation and friendliness. Do you take care of your body? Do you eat healthy? Are you clean? Do you have an anger problem, especially men? Are you conquering lust? Yeah? Cut it off. Do you control your inner fantasies and thoughts? Yeah, do not allow Martin Luther, I don't know if he said it or not. We say a lot of things Martin Luther said that he never said. But he supposedly said that your thoughts are like birds flying around your head. You decide if the birds are allowed to build a nest inside your head. So that, that is a Christian responsibility and sanctification Control your thoughts and don't allow them to continue. Your thought castles and imagining life with another woman. And that's plain language, right? Yep. Do you need cleansing from your lust? A makeover of your mind? Do you manage the three screens in this world? TV, computer, cell phone. What do you do when no one is watching? What kind of person are you in secret? God knows. What is your internet history? W would it be okay if Brother Zadok or I looked at your last 10 YouTube videos, your cell phone texts, your internet history, your websites that you look at? Can God look at your thoughts? Uh, would Jesus be comfortable with your life 24-7? I don't know if you understand the term 24-7 is, is every day, all day long. Whatever you watch, whatever you do on the computer, would you be comfortable? Oh, this is so important. I should stop screen sharing. Would you be comfortable with your life that Jesus joins you and looks at all the videos you're watching? Would you say, Jesus, come join me and watch this with me? Jesus, come, please look at these websites with me. Would, would that be okay? Uh, be totally honest. I'm looking at uh, that. What else? Uh, just a few more things. Not much. I will close. And good things planned for tomorrow. Wrong button. I'm clumsy. There. Uh, let me talk about overcoming and lust is a huge problem among men. And I mentioned that on the first day, I'm not bragging, but thank God he has protected me from alcohol and pornography. Never gone on a bad website or bought a magazine or, or looked at that. I, I cannot afford to have those images sit in my brain like glue. We have an Adventist pastor, Bernie Anderson, who's written a book about this uh, called Breaking the Silence. Okay, He came out in public with that problem. And uh, it, it is rampant, men looking at the wrong things. So let me tell you something. We have an adultery in Genesis chapter 38, incest, horrible. But in 39, there's a contrast Joseph, he, he has the opportunity, but he runs and flees from it. Let me tell you, men especially, flee lust like the plague. Flee like Joseph. Run for your life. It's a, it's a momentary pleasure, but in it, it 
a lifetime and it could possibly cost you eternity. It's not, it's not worth it. So if, if you're dealing with that, deal with it with God. Stop it, cleanse your life, start over and, and maintain purity in your life. Do you need to apologize? Have things gone wrong in your life, terribly wrong? Do you need restoration? Do you listen really? Do you listen patiently? Um, the sparkle in your eye, yes, I will explain that. That's probably good for today anyway. Let me explain the sparkle. Tomorrow we talk about forgiveness. That is a huge topic, forgiveness. Forgiveness is the hardest thing. I've had to deal with that the last few years. I was terminated from denominational employment overnight. Yeah. Practically no warning. 24 hours and I was out. And I've had to deal with forgiveness. I will talk about that tomorrow. There's a very rejection for men is a very difficult uh, thing to deal with. And then I have a final exam tomorrow. Then I will talk about counseling and my personal experience with counseling, the dangers of it, benefits risk factors, and what my absolutely best advice is and what some couples have told me, and I'm not breaking confidentiality, but I want to share with you what some couples are going through, what you're going through possibly, and what to do about it. So I'm going to turn off the screen sharing so I can look at you. This is important. I'm glad you're asking. And especially as a pastor, suit and tie, uh, I don't think I'm all that good looking, but I, it's dangerous. We are in a position of power and respect uh, as pastors. And so uh, let me be frank with you. I'm explaining the Bible. I'm praying. I am suit and tie. And that is attractive to some women. And what this conference president was saying was be careful that your attraction in your eyes to women in the church or in the world, that when there's a glow in the eyes of a female in the church, she shines when she sees you. Make sure that that shine in the woman's eyes and the smile and the connection she's making with you, that that is not a reflection of your shine in your eyes, meaning flirtation. So what this conference president was saying is, I knew him well, he's passed away now. He's saying, if a woman is attracted to you, make sure that does not come from you feeding it with your glow and your smile and your shine and your eyes is now reflected in her eyes. Does that make sense? I'll give you an example. I think it's well worth a few extra minutes again. I was doing a prayer meeting. Prayer meeting is dangerous. Satan hates prayer. I was, I was newly wed, married a few months, maybe just a few weeks. And I'm doing prayer meeting, and I'm so proud of my prayer meeting, Bible study, and uh, I had a Thompson Chain reference Bible, and we're studying about prayer and Nicodemus, the woman at the well. And a woman in our church took an interest in me. And I, I'm going to say it, stupid male, stupid male Ingo I am. I thought she was interested in my theology and my Greek and Hebrew and Bible study. And I was excited. My wife said, no, she has a crush on you. She's falling in love with you. I, I was shocked. My wife saying that. I said, no, she's interested in, uh, in John chapter three. I discovered this and this. My wife smiled and said, no, she, she likes you. I said, what are we going to do about it? My wife said, I will take care of it. <laughs> what we did is after prayer meeting, my wife would stand next to me so that when the ladies came with their Bible questions, but it wasn't about Bible, it was about spending time with me. My wife was right there. Guess what? It solved it. I had another prayer meeting where a woman would come and say, Pastor, 
I have a real issue with, can we pray in your office? I said, we can pray right here. Well, I would like to pray in private. And she wanted to hold my hand. So the shine in her eyes is that a reflection of my eyes. The question then is, did I lead her to believe that I liked her beyond what was appropriate as a Christian brother? And now her interest in me and wanting to hold hands during after prayer meeting in my office alone, did that come originally from me? That's the question. See, was it reciprocal? And I did not pray with her in my office alone holding hands. Absolutely not. Prayer meeting, so dangerous. I will close in one minute. I had a, I had a lady come after prayer meeting saying, uh, my car is not working and everybody was gone. My car is not working. Can I get a ride from you home? A young lady. Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, be careful being alone with women as a man and vice versa. I said, I will call elder so-and-so and see if he can, we, we can give you a ride home together or so, but no. Okay. So am I feeding those kind of requests as a man or is that women taking a like in me? We have to be very careful. When the grass, gentlemen, when the grass appears greener on the opposite side of the fence, it is time to water your own lawn. You understand that? If you start thinking the woman across the street is better than your wife, work on your relationship with your wife. Do not feed that potential relationship. Serious matter, matters, right? We will talk about forgiveness. If things have already gone too far and there are broken things in your heart, in your relationship, we will talk forgiveness tomorrow is a most important topic and it's so hard to do, so difficult. But I know from personal experience uh, I, that I think I can talk about it. I will give you some pointers. We will take a final exam, just some hard questions to ask about your relationship. And I will also talk about counseling or any questions you might send to Brother Zadok. If you're embarrassed, to send them to Brother Zadok. Oh, I got four messages in chat. Uh, I will deal with those questions in a second. If you're embarrassed, I don't know you. Uh, I'm not passing on your emails. I will not analyze your name. Um, I'm promising you, if you send a question directly to me, I'm on Facebook, my website, you can reach me. Brother Zadok is allowed to give out my email. It's okay. You can contact me directly. I will keep it anonymous and then delete any communication. Okay. I've heard every question. I think you will not embarrass me. Um, yeah. The, the whole spectrum of humanity I think I've dealt with. So we can do that. Um, are all men aware of that attraction? No, we are clueless. Okay. Many times, and I'm not trying to be silly. Men are often clueless what's going on. We overstep our boundaries. We push how far we can get with women without having an affair, just being more friendly than necessary. Um, how do you help your spouse understand if such observations are made? Patiently. Yeah, that, that is a very high-risk conversation. He might explode. He might dismiss it. You have to find an opportunity and a, and a pre-conversation where, say, I want to talk to you about something, but I'm afraid how you will react. Okay, prepare the conversation. This is coming from a woman. I think I'm right. I'm not trying to say this to hurt you or to accuse you. I'm just observing the following. I'm letting you know what's in my heart. But you have to get an agreement from your husband, from the man in your life, that he will listen. Otherwise, most men, just like the woman at the well, will react with dismissing it. Oh, no, nah, there's nothing. You're making things up. You're seeing things that are not real. And uh, no, there's nothing going on. And our, our first reaction as sinners is Garden of Eden. 
no, there's no problem. Um, we make excuses. So my advice is you, you have to get some kind of connection with your husband where he might listen to you and take you seriously. Otherwise, our male response is just dismiss it and brush you off. Pastor, can we send, oh, there it is. Can we send personal questions to you? Anonymously, yes. Uh, hang on. I, I get more messages every day than I can possibly handle. But for tomorrow and the near future, I will put other things aside and respond to Kenya. Okay, promise. And I will not tell anybody. Now, Ellen White has said women should go to women. So just this week, I referred a woman who was getting too personal, not with me personally, but she was telling me things I shouldn't know. I showed my wife immediately. Okay. I will not show my wife what you're sending me. Okay. We have a group relationship here. But in that case, I thought my wife needs to know what was sent to me. And then we found help outside of me. But if you send me a message, I will respond anonymously, you and I, and I will not take it any further. Here is my number one email. I have several emails, but I will check this one and respond to you directly. That's right. If that is helpful. Um, I had one more thought. Can't think of it now. Yeah, that's probably enough for today. A lot of material, hard stuff, tears, prayers. I'm praying for you. Don't give up. There are some relationships so broken that seems like there's no way out except separation. But uh, I I don't want to recommend that ever without trying the top ten. Prayer, Bible, love, listen, learn. Communication, money, character, purity, health. Uh, give that a try. Include God in your impossible situation. So I think it's best I pray and then don't go away. Brother Zag has, has an announcement and something to share. But let us pray together. Um, we're getting to our hearts, right? Uh, we're not just talking marriage and, and Bible. We we are bringing the word of God into the dark corners of our hearts, and I pray light will shine. Let us pray together. Oh God, just from the questions and the comments in the chat, I want to present these people that I don't even know, couples, suffering women, sinful men, to you, into your throne room. We sometimes don't know what to do. seems like we've already tried prayer and, and this, and person won't listen. And I want to pray this very moment um, for a breakthrough, a miracle, that there's still a chance, a turnaround. I want to pray for us men that we become listeners. And not immediately respond or be impatient or explode or walk away. I pray for brutal honesty before you. I want to pray for the ladies that are struggling. I want to pray for people that are in tempting situations. Crossing the line in, in thought, in look, in shine, in the eyes, in touch, in comments, and whatever it might be, I pray that the Adams and Eves of 2023, that you might show up in our fallen non-paradise in our relationships and bring us back together in a, in a blessing and harmony in a sense of peace in the relationship.
we are pleading with you in prayer. I want to pray that between now and tomorrow, when we meet again, you grant us an extra measure of your spirit, your blessing, your grace, your intervention. Not a human counselor, priest, or even Ingo, but your presence. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Asante, my brothers and sisters. Karibu. Go ahead, Brother Zarek. Yeah, we're so thankful uh, for the message that you've had today.